A uh, couple of things uh, for you guys to note. Um, finishing up section 6.3 today and moving on into section 6.4, which means there's only one more section after that. And so I went ahead and posted on your Canvas site your next homework set. This is your homework uh, number five for your test number five. And uh, Sondas will be passing uh, a copy out for everybody in the class here. Um, however, I'm going to do something special here because I want to make sure we have enough review time and stuff like that. Um, you know, every Friday we have our review sessions and stuff, so I'm going to make it due at our review session. Our review session is at uh, from 12:30 until um, 1:45. Uh, again, every Friday in Fretwell 113. I'm going to make it due then. If you want to turn it in early, that's fine, but I'm actually going to go over it in that particular review session. And I'll record it so you guys have something to study for the weekend and stuff like that. Which does mean, that since I'm making the homework set due at the end of this week, that does mean that your uh, uh, test number five will be on Monday, uh, April 29th. Just to let you guys know when your next test is going to be. And it will be the last test. And it will be, like I said, uh, covering all this Chapter 6 material and stuff. So, yeah, question. Uh, the following Friday, yeah, May 3rd. That's university policy, yeah. All right, we'll talk more about the final exam later. All right, um, the other thing, if you go up here on your Hulk system, and again, at, at the review session, one last thing. At the review session, I'm passing you guys out a copy of this thing, but uh, if you're going to turn it in at the review session, I always strongly recommend you keep, keep a blank copy for yourself so you can actually take notes off of it and stuff. So here's your link to it. So you can click on this thing and go directly to it. Um, we're also passing back an old homework set as we're speaking right now. Um, the other thing is, if you look at your Hulk system, because we didn't completely finish up section uh, 6.3, I did push it back until Wednesday. So uh, 6.3 homework set, your lesson stuff, is still due. Obviously, 6.1 and 6.2 closed for you this weekend. Um, we also have this coming up uh, Saturday, your last quiz, quiz number 11, and also due on Sunday, uh, the last little bit, 6.4 and 6.5, which will be the two sections that I, I finish up covering this week and stuff. So, uh, again, uh, semester kind of slowly coming to a close here and stuff. So, there we go. All right. So, just to remind you guys, last time what we were doing, we were doing definite integrals. A def integral definition is an integral with bounds. Integral from A to B of f of x dx. This is equal to the antiderivative. So you're using your classic integral rules. And then you draw a little line between A going from A up to B. And according to the what we call fundamental theorem of calculus, you plug in the top number into uh, F of X, make it F of B, minus plug in the bottom number F of A. So when you're done, you don't get a functional answer like we did with indefinite integrals. We get a number that's going to be your answer. This is going to be a numerical value, which will be your answer. And another little formula you need to know is the definition of average value of a function here. The average value of a function is 1 over b minus a times integral from a to b of f of x dx. And you'll know to use the average value formula, so it's all you got is this extra little constant, 1 over b minus a, times that integral from a to b of f of x dx. But you'll know to use the average value formula when the problem says, uh, given f of x equals, find the average value of the function, or some, some kind of wording like that. Um, just to get you guys started, since uh, we're going to be starting section 6.4 today, uh, the idea, now it's a geometric representation concept here. If you remember way back when, and we started this stuff way back in chapter uh, 1 and 2, we started the concept of derivatives after we did limits. And we said that, quote, the derivative, geometrically speaking, is that slope of the tangent line. That was your geometric representation. The derivative was the slope of the tangent line. Well, the antiderivative or integral with bounds is the, ge the geometric representation of that is, quote, the area under the curve. So if f of x is a function that is positive, that means it's located above the x-axis, then for the integral between a and b of f of x dx, this will be equal to the area between, and let me under, f of x and, and back to the x-axis. So when you talk about here's a function f of x right here, here is your x-axis, and this is a positive function because it's located above the x-axis. And when I integrate, what it's actually giving me is this area under the curve. This area right here. 
and this area would be a positive area. However, if f of x is located below the x-axis. That means it is a negative function. Then, when you integrate from a to b of f of x dx, this will be equal to the area between the x-axis to the function f of x, okay, but it will be denoted as negative area. So you're going to get what we call negative area on this particular material. And what I mean by that is this, that when I integrate, and I happen to have, here's the x-axis up here, and here's my function f of x, but it is located below the x-axis, and you're integrating it from a to b, it's going to give you the area back from the curve back to the x-axis, but because the area is located below the x-axis, this will be, quote, negative area. When you calculate it, it will be negative area. So we're going to be talking about calculating the area between two curves with this particular material. And typically the area between two curves is going to be like top minus bottom. But when they give you a particular function, you're going to have to, when you just give a function and talking about area, you're going to have to separate the negative region from the positive region and then make the negative region positive because it really is the area this is going to be a negative. It would be like negative 5, but the area is actually 5 square units or whatever. And then you take the absolute value of it. You take the, take the uh, absolute value negative region, which is positive, and add it to the other part of the region, and then you get a total area between two curves. So this is what section 6.4 is going to be all about. But before we really get deep into this area between two curves type stuff here, let's go back and look at some of our definite integrals and how to integrate. If it's not a rule you have memorized, the number one technique of integration is u substitution. So let's take a look at some of that. So this is where we stopped last time. So we pick it up from here. So we got this problem right here. That is the integral between negative 1 and 2 of negative 4x times 3x squared minus 8 cubed dx. This is not a rule I have memorized. And because we have this power in a set of parentheses, the technique that I'm going to use to integrate this guy is going to be my famous u substitution. Number one technique of u substitution is you're going to let u equal to inside the parentheses. What's inside my parentheses is the 3x squared minus 8 inside the parentheses. So this part becomes u. Then step one, find u. Step two, find du, the derivative. Well, the derivative of 3x squared is 6x. The derivative minus 8 is 0. dx. You put the d on there, let you know what variable you took derivative respect to. Step one, find u. Step two, find du. Step three, move the constant to the other side. I'm going to divide both sides by 6. That gives me 1, 6 du equals x dx. So if this is an appropriate u substitution, Whatever I let u equal to, up to a constant, the du, in this case the x dx, must be in the problem, which it is. So when I substitute, this will turn into the integral. Now this is a constant. Where do constants get to go? Out front. I'm going to stick it in front of the integral. And there's my negative 4 times the integral. This was u, and we're cubing it. And the rest of this problem is the x dx. So if it didn't get substituted with the du or the constant held over, it's got to be substituted with the du. The x dx is equal to a 1 6 du. And I'm going to put the 1 6 du right here. And that's replacing the x dx. I'm just stuck it in the back. Now, before I integrate, I'm going to clean it up. I like to pull all my constants out front. So a negative 4 times a 1 6 is negative 4 6, which reduces to negative 2 thirds. This would be negative 2 thirds, the integral of u cubed du. Negative 2 thirds, sorry, hold your constant over, negative 2 thirds 
Now, what's the integral of u cubed? Add one over add one. So what do I get? See, the whole purpose of u substitution is take nasty looking problems and turn it into simple formulas you have memorized. The integral of u to the n du is u to the n plus one over n plus one, which makes it u to the four over four. And you can put a plus c on this one because we're just doing the indefinite integral on this guy. I'm gonna clean this up. Two goes into four, two times, and two times three is six. So this gives me negative one six u to the four plus c. And then I back substitute. So it'll be negative one six times u, which is your 3x squared minus 8 to the 4th plus c. Now, all this work is just to integrate this guy. You've got to find the antiderivative. But this is not a traditional indefinite integral. This is a definite integral. we got bounds. So there's one more hoop to jump through. So once you get your antiderivative, you write that down. This will be negative 1 6 times 3x squared minus 8 to the 4th. But instead of putting the plus c, you put your bracket from negative 1 to 2. And then you apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is evaluate at your top bound minus evaluate at your bottom bound. Plug in top minus plug in bottom. So when I do that, I end up getting this is equal to negative 1 6 times 3 times 2 squared minus 8 to the 4th minus negative 1 6 times 3 times negative 1 squared minus 8 to the 4th. Literally, plug in top minus plug in bottom. So at this point, it becomes nothing but a uh, crunch number crunch problem here. So order of operations work inside the parentheses. 2 squared is what? 4 times 3 is 12. And 12 minus 8 is uh, back to 4 again. So I'm just going to clean this up for your benefit. That'll be negative 1, 6 times 4 to the 4. A minus, a minus, it makes it plus 1, 6. Now, here we go. Negative 1 squared is um, 1 times 3 is 3. 3 minus 8 is negative 5 to the 4. I'm just, again, just all you got to do is just make sure you don't make some bonehead careless error on this thing. We're crunching your numbers. Now, 4 to the 4th is, putting on my calculator, 4 raised to the 4th is 550, I'm sorry, two, excuse me, 256. So this is equal to negative 256 over 6 plus parentheses negative 5 to the 4th. When you raise a negative to an even power, it's going to be back to positive again. 625 over 6. They already have a common denominator, so you just add up their numerators. Negative 256 plus 625 is equal to 369 divided by 6. And if you want to reduce that, 369 divided by 6 is 61.5, or for you math fraction fans, 123 halves, which is equal to 61.5. We'll take either answer. Does that make sense? Again, on my test, I'm going to tell you guys also how to cheat. No work means no credit. If you don't show me all this beautiful math, you get nothing, because I'm showing you guys that, hey, look, we all make careless errors. When I, where I'm going to make my careless error is some bonehead mistake here in plugging in these numbers, and, you know, negative 1 squared is negative 1 or something stupid like that. Negative 1 quantity squared would be positive 1, but one false move makes, it, makes you have a mistake. So, last thing I'm going to do on this problem is I'm going to check my calculator. Under math, it's TI-84. I've got the uh, new operating system on this thing. And again, if you have the old operating system, the, uh, the code is math number nine, function integrate, F-N-I-N-T. If you've got the old operating system, it's computer. You type in F-N-I-N-T, parentheses, type in the function, comma, X, comma, low bound, comma, upper bound. That's your code. For the uh, new operating system on this thing, you hit math number 9, and the little template of an integral shows up. This thing is from negative 1 to 2 of negative 4x times parentheses 3x squared minus 8 close parentheses cubed over arrow dx. And if I did this right, what should pop out of this little problem here? My calculator? 61.5. And I must have got it right. It's... 
confirming, and it also makes you feel good about yourself when, hey, the calculator agrees with you. Because a lot of the times it doesn't, which means I typically screwed up. Now, here's another thing I've always had a problem with students. If the calculator tells you one answer and you got something else, which one do you think is wrong? Yeah, that's what happens. Uh, people think the calculator is wrong. Well, yeah, you may want to go against the calculator, but 99 times out of 100, dude, it's you. You made some bonehead careless error. This is why I'm trying to show you this stuff. Don't argue with the calculator. Go with it. Just make sure you type it in right. Don't get me wrong there. All right, take a look at this next guy. Yes. What's that? I did. I did mention the homework set to them, and we'll go ahead and pass them out now. That's fine. Yeah. All right, so here we go. So I thought I'd do you guys a favor and do like I always do and print out an X, X copy for you guys. But last time, people were like grabbing four or five of them. One copy. The other, the other copy you could need to make yourself. All right, so here's this problem here. This problem is this. The integral from 5 to 9 of 2 plus 8 natural log of x divided by x dx. Now, this is one of those classic problems of... What am I going to let you equal to? Because it's clearly not a rule I have memorized. So this is the integral of 2 plus 8 natural log of x divided by x. I worry about the bounds at the end. Now remember what we said here. Number one, with u substitute, because this is not a rule I have memorized. I'm going to let u equal to inside parentheses. Well, only parentheses I see up here is an x. And we also mentioned this. In U substitution, letting U equal X is absolutely stupid because it actually doesn't change the problem. The goal is to change this problem into a form you have memorized. So this, because this is the only parenthesis I have, don't ever let U equal X in U substitution. So number two, I let U equal to exponents on E's. I don't have any of that. I let U equal to the denominator. Well, I do have a fraction, but what's in the denominator? X and letting U equal X is stupid in U substitution because it doesn't, quote, change the problem. So I'm back to the catch-all phrase. What am I going to let u equal to? Let u equal to something such that du, its derivative, is in the problem. And I do see that natural log of x, and I see that x on the bottom. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to let u equal to the denominator, the entire numerator, which is 2 plus 8 times the natural log of x. Then du, when I take its derivative, is derivative of 2 is 0, 8 is a constant, derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x, or 8 over x, dx. Now, I always move the constant to the other side. So, one step one, find u. Step two, find du. Step three, move the constant to the du side. So, I'm going to multiply by 1 eighth on both sides. That gives me 1 eighth du equals 1 over x, dx, which is in the problem. So, I know I'm on the right track. So, when I substitute, this turns into the integral. This was u in the numerator. And the x on the bottom dx gets replaced with a 1 8 du. Cleaning it up, the 1 8 goes out front, the 1 8 the integral of u du. This officially is u to the first power. So the integral of u to any power, provided it's not negative 1, is add 1 over add 1. The integral of u to the first is going to be add 1, u squared over 2. So holding your constant, 1 8 times u squared over 2. Cleaning that up, that gives you a 1 16th u squared. And when I back substitute, that will be 1 16th u. And u was this 2 plus 8 natural log of x, quantity squared. And you can put a plus c on it if you want to. That's up to you. But it is a definite integral, and we don't need this plus c. I just needed to show my integration. Now, to finish up this problem here, this is going to be equal to, turning it into, this is 1 16th times 2 plus 8 natural log of x squared. No plus c's, but we got bounds. We're going from 5 to 9. Now, applying my <coughs> fundamental theorem of calculus aspect of this thing here, plug in top minus plug in bottom, this is going to be 1 16th times 2 plus 8 natural log of 9 squared minus 1 16th times 2 plus 8 natural log of 5 squared. Now, the natural log of 9, natural log of 5 are nothing but crappy numbers on your calculator. So I'm afraid your answer is not going to get much better than this in terms of the way you write out for an exact value. So the answer is going to be, 
like I said, it's going to be 2 plus 8 times the natural log of 9, quantity squared, divided by 16, minus 2 plus 8 natural log of 5, quantity squared, divided by 16. But I did say we could approximate this answer, and usually with these guys, a hawks likes to have it about two or three decimal places, so pay attention whatever directions they tell you. So if I do this problem, I'm going to put parentheses, 2 plus 8 natural log of 9, close parentheses for the log, close parentheses for the numerator, squared, divided by 16, minus parentheses 2 plus 8 natural log of 5, close parentheses for the log, close parentheses for the, uh, the numerator, squared, divided by 16, and I end up getting an answer of 10.12559513. And I'm going to write out all the decimals here. 10.12559513. And if we did go with that two decimal place thing here, that would be what? 10.13 as my answer if I rounded it off. But again, the last thing I'm going to do to this problem is... I'm going to double check on a calculator because I don't trust myself. I never know when I'm going to make a careless error. So this is the integral from 5 to 9, just typing in the original problem, of parentheses around your numerator. 2 plus 8 natural log of x, close parentheses for the log, close parentheses for the numerator, divided by x, and then integrating that with respect to x, dx. And I always feel good when the exact same answer pops up on the calculator. So I'm feeling good about this answer. Does that make sense? Questions? We'll take a look at this next guy. It says this, quote, find the average value. So this is a pure formula you need to memorize. Find the average value for the function f of x equals 8x cubed plus 6 on the interval between... 1 and 4. Just to remind you, the average value formula is equal to 1 over b minus a times integral from a to b of f of x dx. And so in this example, your a is given to be 1, your b is equal to 4. So this is 1 over 4 minus 1 times integral from 1 to 4 of your function 8x cubed plus 6 dx. So you get this extra constant on this guy. Okay? So clean him up. So this would be equal to 4 minus 1 is 3, so this would be 1 third times integral from 1 to 4 of 8x cubed plus 6dx. And now we're going to integrate. Hold that 1 third out front. I'm going to put a little bracket right there. It's just my little extra constant out front. 8 is a constant. Leave it alone. What is the integral of x cubed? Add 1 over add 1. What do you get? x to the 4th over 4 plus what's the integral of 6 with respect to x? 6x. And no bound, no pluses on this one. you got bounds. Bracket from 1 to 4. Personally, I would clean this up a little bit. 4 goes in the 8 two times. So this gives you <coughs> 1 third times bracket. 2x to the 4th plus 6x, evaluated from 1 to 4. And then we apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. Plug in top minus plug in bottom. Plugging in top, I get 1 third times 2 times 4 to the 4th plus 6 times 4. Minus plug in bottom. Notice the use of brackets and parentheses here. Minus 1 third times 2 times 1 to the 4th plus 6 times 1. Evaluated from 1 to 4. Plug in top minus plug in bottom. So at this point, it becomes a game of multiplication. So here we go. 2 times 4 to the 4th plus 6 times 4. Just cleaning up this guy here. And I get 536. So this is 536 divided by 3. Just left my 3 out front. Then it's going to be minus 2 times 1 to the 4th plus 6 times 1. 
Uh, I really didn't need to put it on the calculator. One to any power is one. That's two plus six. The answer is eight, but there it is. Eight, but over three, minus eight thirds. The reason why I left it like this is because they do have a common denominator, so I just got to subtract the numerator. 536 minus 8 is 528 thirds. And when I clean that up, and just divide it out, I get 176. There's my answer. And just to remind you of what this represented, because we talked about this formula also last time, was that if you look at the function 8x cubed plus 6 on the interval between 1 and 4 and analyze their y-coordinates, the average y-coordinate between the x values of 1 and 4 is going to be 176. It's the average functional value, average y-coordinate. All right, take a look at this guy here. The daily production level for a product that is given by n of x is 270 minus 270 e to the negative 0.4x units, where x is time and hours of production after production begins. The average production during the first six hours, write your answer in the uh, in exact form or round it off to the nearest whole number. All right. Read the function. Read the question. Find the average production during the first six hours. If this was some kind of marginal profit or whatever, to actually get profit, you would integrate it. And if they said, what was your profit for the first six items produced, you would integrate from zero to six. You always start with your production at zero because you didn't make anything until you produce it out. But they put the word what? Average production, average value, because this is a production. The average value formula, to remind you again, average value is equal to this 1 over b minus a times integral from a to b of f of x dx. That is a pure formula we have memorized. So in our particular average formula, the average production over the first six hours would be 1 over 6 minus 0 times integral from 0 to 6 of my function, which is 270 minus 270e to the negative 0.4x dx. Now, this has got a two-part problem here, so we're going to do it in separate parts. So this would be equal to, clean it up, 6 minus 0 is 6. So this is 1 6 times integral from 0 to 6 of 270dx minus 1 6 times integral from 0 to 6 of 270e to the negative 0.4x dx. Now let me pause here for just a second and ask you guys, what did I just do here? When I got a function that's being added or subtracted, I officially have to integrate each one. The first part of my function is a constant. Now, the, the, the 270. Now remember, 1 6 is out front of the integral, so when you distribute the integral, you're going to distribute the 1 6 with it because it's your constant out front. But this is just a constant. That's easy to integrate. This guy over here is the second part. That's the 270e to the negative 0.4x dx. That requires a special technique of integration. So I broke it up into two different intervals. This first one is real simple. This will be 1 6 times what is the integral of 270dx with respect to x? 270x. And you put your bounds evaluated from 0 to 6. Now, this would be minus, I'm going to hold this 1, 6 just for a second, and I'm going to pull this guy off. This would be the integral of 270e to the negative 0.4x dx. With integrating this one, now, the constant can go out front. I'm not worried about the constant. It's this e to the negative 0.4x. This is not a formula I have memorized, so I'm going to have to use my u substitution. With your techniques of u substitution, what are you going to let u equal to? Well, one inside parentheses, there's a parentheses on this one. What's number two on your list? Exponent on e. So I'm going to let u equal to this negative 0.4x. That means the du, the derivative, is going to be negative 0.4 dx. Move the constant to the other side. I do the same steps every time. One, find u. Two, find du. Three, move the constant to the du side. So this gives you 
1 over negative 0.4 du equals dx, 5, substitute. This will turn into, with 270 as a constant, it holds over. This is e to the u, but the dx gets replaced with a negative 1 over 0.4 du. So I'm going to clean this up, and this is classic calculator at this point. 270 times 1 divided by this negative 0.4 gives me negative 675. Integral b to the u du. What's integral e to the u again? Next, negative 675. Integral e to the u is e to the u. And then you back substitute. This will be negative 675 e to the negative 0.4x. There's what my antiderivative is. So I left the one negative 1, 6 out front, so it'll be a bracket. Negative 675 e to the negative 0.4x. And then I put my bounds back on there from 0 to 6. I integrate this guy, and I integrate this guy, and now I'm going to evaluate it. Does that make sense? Cleaning it up, of course. 270 divided by 6 is 45. So this is equal to, cleaning it up, 45x evaluated from 0 to 6. A negative times a negative is going to be a plus. 675 divided by 6 is 112.5. e to the negative 0.4x evaluated from 0 to 6. All I did was just put my constants together. Now, apply the fundamental theorem, plug in top minus plug in bottom on both parts. So this is equal to 45 times 6 minus 45 times 0 plus plug in top 112.5e to the negative 0.4 times 6 Minus plug in bottom 112.5 e to the negative 0.4 times 0. Now 45 times 0, that's 0. That part goes away. Now e to the negative 0.4 times 0, that'll be e to the, well, negative 0.4 times 0 is still 0, but e to the 0 is what? 1. This makes this 1. So I end up getting 45 times 6 which is 270 plus 112.5e to the negative 0.4 times 6 is a whopping negative 2.4. So it's 270 plus 112.5e to the negative 2.4 minus 112.5. Combining my like terms here, 270 minus... 112.5 is 157.5 plus 112e to the negative 2.4. There is the exact value. Does that make sense? And again, just be careful. Don't screw up your basic arithmetic on numbers. The last thing I'm going to do here is, they did say round this thing off to the nearest whole number. Fine. So that'll be 157.5 plus 112. Oh, uh, I lost the 0.5 on that. I sure did. 0.5. Yep, lost my little 0.5 there. Uh, 0.5 e to the uh, uh, negative 2.4. And I went for the calculator here. This is uh, 167. 167.7057697. But it did say, did say round it to the nearest whole number. What would that be? All right, 168. And because this is a problem that had bounds, I'm going to put this thing on my calculator, and I'm just going to double check myself just to make sure. But you needed to know this average value formula. So this is... Um, 1 over 6, parentheses around fractions, 1, 6, times math number 9, whoops, wrong button there, math number 9, function integrate from 0 to 6 of 270 minus 270 e raised to the negative 0.4x over arrow dx.
And so I made them look exactly like my integral with the one sixth out front. And let's see if I get 167.7057. So I'm feeling real good about my answer. You can see, plugging in these numbers, there's lots of places for careless errors. And I've seen your test. You guys will find every possible way to make a careless error and then make some extra ones that I never thought of. So use your calculator. It's there to help you out. Does that make sense? But here's the deal. If I don't see this work where you're actually showing me how to do this problem, because I know with some of you people, you see this problem, you know the formula, you plug it in and you give me this, and you think you're going to get something or other. Well, you're wasting my time. So this is a 10-point problem. I'm going to take all 15 points just for spite, make me look at crap without work on it. Give me the work. I want to see the work on these problems. Does that make sense? So, yes, you can make a negative grade on my next test if you don't watch yourself. Show the work. Show me you know how what you're doing. All right. Section 6.4 is on this area and the applications thereof. So area. We talked about this before about to calculate area, when you integrate a function with bounds, it gives you that area, quote, under the curve. And if the area, ha the, the curve happens to be below the x-axis when you integrate it, it'll actually give you negative area. So you have to kind of separate the positive regions from the negative regions. So let's talk about this and talk about some of the terminology we're using here. All right, so here we go under our little learn mode here. It says this, for y equals f of x, a continuous function on the interval between a and b, the integral from a to b of f of x dx represents a, the total area bounded by the curve and the x-axis from uh, x equals a to x equals b if f of x is non-negative, a.k.a. positive, but you can't be negative. Negative is located below the x-axis. You could literally hit zero, so that's okay. So that's why we say non-negative. But uh, really we think of positive above the x-axis when we do this stuff. Okay. For all x uh, in the interval between a and b. And number two, quote, the difference between the areas uh, above the x-axis and below the x-axis uh, that are bounded by the curve in the x-axis from x equals a to x equals b if f of x equal is negative for any x in between a and b. Okay, so again, we're going to break these guys up and, and, and this idea of the difference between the areas above the x-axis and below the x-axis, you want to separate these regions out. So if I've got a graph that does something like this, and you're integrating from 0 to 5 over here, whatever it happens to be, you're going to have this little region right here, that's going to be a negative region. You want to separate him out and figure out what that area is, but when you integrate it, you'll get a negative answer and you're going to make him positive to see what the area is. And then you're going to find this particular area right in here. This will give you a positive answer because that particular section of the graph is above the x-axis. That's what we're talking about taking the difference between these two guys. And this minus the negative makes it a positive total area. So number two, if part of the region above the x-axis and part is below the x-axis, we must, here it is, separate the integral. into two parts to find the total area. You need to separate the negative region from the positive region and then calculate each one. Does that make sense? And then absolute value, because when we're talking about total area, we don't want the negatives to cancel with the positives, because if you've got to graph something like this, and I go from zero to whatever this number is, B over here, this region will cancel with this region, and if you just integrate, you're going to get an answer of zero, because the negative cancels with the positive. But you don't want it. This is not area of zero. There's actually area here. You have to separate the negative region from the positive region. When asked to find the area of a function bounded by the x-axis on the interval between a and b, you should always sketch the graph. This is how you're going to know which one's above the x-axis and which one's below it. Sketch the graph, a.k.a. use your graphing calculator. Get a good picture of this stuff. Uh, sketch the graph of the function being integrated whenever possible. A couple of formulas, though, with this stuff. Additional properties is this. 
If you ever want to, quote, change the balance, this one, in negative the integral between b to a of f of x dx. If you notice, the bounds are written backwards. Usually the b's on top, the a's on the bottom. So if you want to switch the bounds, you just negate the problem. So this would be equal to the integral between a and b of f of x dx. What happened? I switched the bounds and made it negative. What's a negative and negative going to make you? Back to being positive. So anytime you switch the bounds, I can always switch the bounds. Just think about it. Fundam this the definite integral. Plug in top minus plug in bottom. But if you wanted the bounds are backwards, you're going to plug, you know, you basically, when you switch the bounds, you're going to have plug in bottom minus plug in top. You can just negate that and you get the exact same thing. So anytime you need to switch the bounds, you just negate the problem. And the other one is this. When you integrate from A to B of f of x dx is equal to whatever, where C is any point in between A is less than or equal to C, which is, equal, is less than or equal to B. You can always break up your integrals. C is some arbitrary constant between A and B. So this will be equal to the integral from A up to arbitrary C of f of x dx plus integral from C up to B of f of x dx. And just to give you a visual on this guy, here's your function f of x. Here's A over here, and here's B over here, and here's C somewhere in the middle. So when I integrate from A to B, I'm going to get the, quote, area under the curve. But I can also get the area under the curve, between that curve back to the x-axis. When I integrate from A to C, this part right here, integral from A to C, and I'm going to add that to the integral from C to B this part over here. So I can break up regions into little sections if I needed to over any value C that's between A and B. So let's take a look at this uh, www.hawkstv.com example here. It says this. Read the questions. It says, find the total area bounded by the x-axis in the curve f of x is equal to x squared plus 2x minus 3 over the interval between 1 and 3. Anytime you hear the word area, total area, what should you do? Graph it. I want to see this guy. So I'm going to come over here and grab my handy dandy calculator. Turning it on. I'm going to go to y equals. I'm going to graph this function. x squared plus 2x minus 3. And I'm going to do a zoom 6. Zoom 6, negative, zoom standard, negative 10 by 10, negative 10 by 10 screen. Okay, very important. Yeah, I've got some regions captured below the x-axis and some above the x-axis. Oh, pay attention to your bounds. All we care about is between 1 and 3. So if I graph this guy, this thing looked like this. It goes over here to 1, and it crosses over here at uh, negative 3. It goes to this point and this point, and it's a parabola. And it did this. I'm just sketching the graph. Oops. There's my graph. Okay? I just should be basically sketching it. But what are my bounds? Between 1 and 3. So between 1, 2, 3. And so over here, if you look at the function and you project it back, where is the area located at? It is above the x-axis. So I don't have to break up my integral here. If I was integrating between negative 3 and positive 3, then I would have to break up between negative 3 and 1, and then from 1 to 3. But this, between 1 and 3, the region is above the x-axis. This is going to be a positive answer area when I'm done. So this would be this area that we're referring to would be equal to the integral from low 1 to upper 3 of your function, x squared plus 2x minus 3 dx. So integrate, integral x squared is x cubed over 3, plus 2 is a constant, integral of x to the first power, add 1 over add 1, x squared over 2, minus integral of 3 with respect to x is 3x. No plus c's because you've got bounds evaluated from 1 to 3. Here the 2's cancel, go ahead and knock that out. And then apply the fundamental theorem plug in top. This would be 3 cubed over 3 
plus 3 squared minus 3 times 3. Plug in top for all the x's. Minus plug in bottom for, for all the x's. That'll be 1 cubed over 3 plus 1 squared minus 3 times 1. So at this point, nothing but number crunch. I don't think I really need a calculator for this one. Let's try it out. 3 cubed is 27. 27 divided by 3 is what? 9 plus 3 squared is 9 minus 3 times 3 is uh, 9. I can handle that kind of math. Okay, fractions over here worries me. Minus 1 cubed is a 1 third plus 1 squared is 1 minus 3 times 1 is minus 3. Here we go. 9 minus 9 cancels. So this is equal to 9 minus, we got 1 minus 3, which is negative 2. And negative 2 plus a third, I'll put that on the old calculator. Negative 2 plus 1 third is actually negative 1 and 2 thirds or negative 5 thirds. Okay. And all I did was just kind of put these guys together. And if you, if you want to, you can literally just plug it in like this. 1 third was it plus 1 minus 3 you get this and I just convert it to a fraction of negative 5 thirds but it's minus negative 5 thirds so minus minus makes it plus and so uh, again 9 is 27 thirds or thirds 27 thirds plus 5 thirds is 32 thirds there is the exact area in the curve and for these people that love 32 thirds that's also known as 10.6666667 unit squared if you want to talk about you know, the area of this guy. Does that make sense? Questions? Stuff's not difficult, but you got to pay attention to it. All right? So the rest of these problems here are problems of, quote, find the total area bounded by the curves and stuff. But the first thing you got to do is you got to graph it. All right? So let me get you guys set up for this one, and then we'll finish these guys next time. So let's take a look at this one. This one is... 9x squared plus 6x plus 9. And all we care about is between 2 and 3, but when I go and do it zoom 6 on this guy, it's a parabola x squared. It's way up there, so I'm going to have to extend my window. I'm just going to change my uh, y numbers here to like maybe 50 or something like that, and you get to see more of the graph up here. There's my graph. So... The graph looks like this, and all you care about is between 2 and 3. So we're talking about this particular area in the curve. So what you're going to see is every time we do one of these problems, we're going to draw this thing out. Again, this entire region is above the x-axis, so to calculate this area, this will be equal to the integral from 2 to 3 of 9x squared plus 6x plus 9dx. We will finish this problem next time because I want to make sure that we pass back the test right now. So.